In this video, we're going to discuss one of the applications we can use with uh, uh, electron configurations, and that's the concept of periodic trends. These will be patterns that we'll see on the periodic table that can be explained by understanding the arrangement of electrons in individual elements. Let's start with a quick rundown of the learning objectives of this video. Uh, first, before we dive into some of the technical stuff, we'll talk about some of the historical background of the periodic table itself. Where did it come from? What were its roots, etc., etc.? Uh, and then we'll get into the actual table structure. Uh, we'll talk about some basic organization, the idea of groups and periods, and then lead into the concept of trends. These will be larger patterns of things that we see in the periodic table associated with specific characteristics. Finally, uh, we're not going to get into the actual trends in this video itself, but I do want to introduce, introduce the properties that are associated with these trends or patterns. Uh, we're going to be looking into atomic radius, which is the measure of the size of an atom. We're going to be looking into ionization energy, which is a measure of how much energy it takes to remove an electron. And finally, we're going to take a look at something known as electronegativity, uh, which is the energy, um, which is a force that atoms exert on shared pair or bonding pairs of electrons. Let's begin our discussion with the historical backgrounds of the periodic table and where it came from. Uh, the scientist responsible for the first creation of a periodic table is a fellow by the name of Dmitry Mendeleev. Mendeleev was a Russian-born scientist, uh, born February 8th, 1934. He actually started with very humble beginnings. Uh, I believe his father died when he was very young. His mother tried to raise him and what, it, by all accounts, is many, 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 many siblings, or more in the teens, uh, and had a very difficult time doing that. Uh, about when he was early on in his life, maybe about 10 years old, uh, his mother recognized his intelligence and basically went on this epic quest across the country of Russia, uh, running for hundreds and hundreds of miles on horseback to bring him to a place where he could get a proper education. And after a few failures, bringing him hundreds of miles and people rejecting him, uh, he was eventually accepted into a college uh, and then led to the very wonderful discoveries that came on later in his life. Uh, unfortunately, all of this comes along with very tragic uh, consequences shortly after getting him into a school uh, where he was able to do the things and, and make the great discoveries he made. Uh, his mother died shortly thereafter, never seeing her son's success. So again, a wonderful story getting someone to uh, get the education they need, but unfortunately with a tragic ending to go along with it. Uh, what uh, Mendeleev is most known for is the concept of periodic law and the actual periodic table itself. Uh, at the time, there were only 56 elements approximately known. I think there was about one element being discovered a year at that particular point in time. Uh, what Mendeleev was able to do was recognize that there are, seem to be these underlying patterns in all these elements. And if you arrange them in certain ways, those patterns become more and more elements. And that's what he did. He came up with an, a way of arranging elements on the periodic table, arranging elements themselves. And and he eventually started seeing these very distinct patterns. And these patterns were so clear to him, he was actually able to see where data at the time, and the data that he used to do this organization was atomic weights, he was able to see the data at the time. Some of that data actually didn't make sense, and he suspected that it was wrong. And then other data was missing. You can see on the table at the right, which is a rendition of his original periodic table, he put in a bunch of question marks for elements that he thought, this element must be here somewhere, but it hasn't necessarily been discovered yet. Now, the interesting thing about all of this is that there are actually many other scientists who proposed similar ideas all at the same time, but what made Mendeleev really interesting interesting and made him really remembered for this is his ability to identify bad data in terms of incorrect atomic masses and missing data. His table was so complete that it contained, it had the ability to make predictions. And that's why we remember him as the creator of the periodic table and not those other scientists. So that develops today into the periodic table that we know and, uh, and recognize. Uh, with a couple minor tweaks, with a couple structural differences, and the addition of many, many more elements, that creates the picture that you guys have been working with all year. Our job in this particular section is to recognize that this piece of paper is not just a reference document to look up numbers from, but it actually has many, many, many layers of organization to it, uh, a testament, uh, I think, to the genius of the organizational scheme that Dmitry Mendeleev came up with. Uh, we're going to start that discussion today on these layers of organization uh, by talking about some basic trends and some of the more advanced ones. So we'll begin by talking about some of the basic levels of organization. Uh, the periodic table is organized into columns, and the periodic table is organized into rows. Uh, the first of which we'll talk about will be these columns here. Now, very often you're going to hear me use this term here, the idea of groups, but some people refer to these as families. And just like a family of people tends to have very similar characteristics, uh, families of elements have similar characteristics. Uh, these are going to be the columns. 
on the periodic table. And that's the first thing you should definitely get here is that the groups are columns. Uh, elements that are grouped in families or groups are there because they have similar properties. And the reason they have similar properties is because they have similar electron configurations. The neat thing is, is that this is how Mendeleev organized his periodic table. Uh, but it turns out that he was really organizing by electron configuration, which is why the table has so many applications today, even though it's hundreds of years later and electrons weren't even known at the time. And again, as we said, this is how originally uh, Mendeleev put his periodic table together. Less commonly discussed, but also important, would be the periods on the periodic table, and those periods represent rows on the periodic table. Now, rows of elements do not have similar properties, but they do have progressively changing electron configurations, meaning every element in a row has one more electron than the other. So this is what starts to generate some of the patterns that we're seeing, because it's a regular changing electron configuration, which causes regular changes in properties. Before we move on too much further, uh, you should have somewhere from class or somewhere in your notes a picture that looks similar to this. Uh, as we talked about, there are groups and families on the periodic table. And this diagram here does some of that organization. It shows you the names of a lot of the groups that go along with it. Uh, and these are names that I definitely expect you guys to be familiar with. There are also non-group kind of things. For example, we have the transition metals here in the center, the inner transition metals, the lanthanides and actinides down here at the bottom. Uh, these are all, again, terms I expect you guys to be able to familiar with. familiar with. I should be able to say, no gases and you should know that I'm dealing with this particular part of the periodic table here helium all the way down through radon if you don't have a diagram something like this in your notes uh, or from class uh, please make sure you go online find a picture of this and make sure you have it handy there's plenty of them now let's get into the discussion of trends themselves uh, we're going to start with a very quick definition what a trend is is a pattern in physical or chemical properties that changes regularly with locations on the periodic table. So we're going to expect to see as we do certain things on the periodic table, there are certain predictable things that happen to these associated properties. These properties and trends exist because of the structure of the periodic table itself. And we've already said this a little bit. Uh, the periodic table was arranged by similar properties, and as a result, it was arranged by those electron configurations. As the electron configurations progressively change, the properties progressively change, and hence we generate patterns. Now the goal of this process, the reason we identify these trends, is they can be used to predict the relative characteristics of an element without having to look up the actual data. For example, I can look at two elements and know which one is going to be the larger atom versus the smaller atom based on where they are on the periodic table. This ability to relatively compare different chemicals and different elements makes you much quicker and much more effective in your ability to discuss and understand chemical concepts. To get a little more detailed here, we're going to define these trends in a couple of very specific ways. We're going to talk about an increase or decrease in a certain property as we go across the periodic table. And we're going to talk about an increase or decrease in a certain property as we go down the periodic table. So what happens to property A as we move from left to right? And what happens to property A as we move from top to bottom? And all of the trends we're going to define are going to be defined in these terms. To display this graphically, we're actually going to be using this very frequently. This is just a blank copy of our periodic table. And again, the trends we're interested in is what happens to our property as we go across the periodic table from left to right, and what happens to our property as we go down the periodic table from top to bottom. Uh, and we're going to identify specific trends, and there's going to be three of them we're going to talk about, and we're going to identify what they do left to right and what they do top to bottom. By the time we're done with this discussion, you'll have a picture like this in your notes uh, with a summary of all three of those properties and their trends, um, so we have this to reference. To wrap things up then, uh, what I want to do is a quick discussion of the actual properties we're going to be looking into themselves, most of which are very easy to understand. They're pretty straightforward concepts. The easy of which, easiest of uh, which is going to be this first one here, which is atomic radius. And by the way, a lot of these have very large names that go along with them, so we tend to use abbreviations. We use AR for atomic radius. Uh, basically what it is is what it sounds like. It's the dis distance from the nucleus to the outermost electron. In actuality, it's the radius of the atom. Uh, a general way of speaking of it, it talks about generally the size of an atom. Something with a bigger atomic radius is a larger atom. Something with a smaller atomic radius is a smaller atom. You'll notice that the di oh, well, let's talk about units first. Uh, the units for this are measured in a something called angstroms. Uh, what an angstrom is, is one, uh, I think it says 10 billionths of a meter. Uh, another way of putting it is there are 10 angstroms for every one nanometer, and a nanometer is a billionth of a meter. 
Uh, really quickly on the picture on the right, this is how we measure uh, atomic radiuses very, very often. You can imagine this is a difficult thing to record. Uh, basically, what we take is a diatomic molecule, something, for example, that's made of two of the same element bonded together. We can very easily measure the distance of the bond length, which is the distance from between both nuclei, and then half of that distance over here is going to represent our radius or the size of our individual atom. The second term we're going to look into is something known as electronegativity. Uh, what electronegativity is, is the attractive force an atom exerts on a bonding or shared pair of electrons. So you've got two atoms, they're bonded together, each one of them is pulling on the electrons in the middle. Electronegativity is a measurement of how strong that pull actually is. Uh, this is actually one of the more important things we'll deal with. Uh, this is something we're going to use later on in the year uh, to discuss a concept known as polarity, something you probably covered in your bio classes. Uh, the units for um, electronegativity are things known as Paulings. This is a unit made specifically to measure this, uh, and it is represented by the Greek letter chi, this curly capital X. Uh, just to give a quick graphical representation of electronegativity, and again, we'll talk about this later on in the year, uh, if you have two, again, atoms bonded together, atom A bonded to atom B, you can imagine this bond is made up of two shared electrons or a pair of shared electrons in the center. Now, atom B pulls on this shared pair of electrons towards itself, and atom A pulls on this shared pair of electrons towards itself. The strength B can pull would be its electronegativity. The strength that A pulls would be its electronegativity. So we can measure how much each of these pull. You can imagine then if the strength that pulls with A is not the same as the strength that pulls with B. This is kind of like a tug of war match. A is going to win this battle, and as a result, those electrons are going to get pulled more in this direction they wouldn't be, and that would result in an uneven sharing of electrons which leads to the concept of polarity. So again, for now though, you really just need to understand the idea that electronegativity is the pull an atom exerts on a shared pair of electrons. Our last topic then that we're going to talk about in terms of trends is the idea of ionization energy. And this one again is a pretty simple. Uh, ionization energy is basically the energy needed to remove the outermost electron of an atom in the gaseous state. This process of removing an electron creates a charged ion and creates an ion. And that's where the term ionization, um, the ization uh, suffix here means to make and basically we're making an ion. Um, so it's the energy to make an ion basically. Uh, by the way, just so you know, this term is also sometimes known as ionization potential, uh, which is something that you would find on your periodic table. And in fact, your periodic table, if you recall, a potential in physics is a voltage, and that's exactly how your periodic table reports it. Over here on the right, again, a quick picture. We can input a certain source of energy here, and we can increase that amount of energy until event eventually we've added in enough energy that it's going to cause a certain electron to be ejected. And the electron that gets ejected is the easiest one to eject, and the easiest one to eject is always the outermost electron. This actually ties back to the beginning of this unit where we talked about the fact that electrons can absorb energy and jump. You can imagine if you put in a little energy, it can cause light to be given off, and if you put in more energy, you're eventually going to cause that electron to jump up so high in the atom that it actually gets removed. That amount of energy is what we talk about with ionization energy. So as we already mentioned, uh, the units in some cases can be volts. How? Oh, and so moving on then, uh, the last thing we'll talk about about ionization energies, we won't get into this in class, uh, but the concept of successive ionization energies. If you remove one electron, there's now a new outermost electron. So your successive ionization energy, meaning the second, third, or fourth ionization energy, would be the energy needed to remove the next electron in the atom. How much energy to take to remove the second, the third, and the fourth. And these all can be measured by putting in more and more energy. Typically speaking, uh, these successive ionization energies are usually bigger than the previous one, so the second is always more energy than the first. Uh, but most of the important thing about this is that this actually is an entirely separate trend. The patterns we'll see with ionization energy are necessarily different than the patterns we'll see with successive ionization energies. We're going to focus on this idea up here, and we're actually going to leave this off. It's still a definition I expect you guys to be comfortable with, though. So the process then that we're going to be going into to deal with this is we're going to want to get data from our periodic table and we're going to find patterns in it. And if you're ever looking to find patterns in data, the goal is to plot things. Uh, what we're going to be plotting is atomic number versus the property in question, say for example uh, atomic radius. And the reason we use atomic number is because this is a way of basically referencing location on your periodic table. And again, we want to see how patterns change based on where we are on the periodic table. So atomic number connects us to the periodic table, and then we measure that against the property we're particularly interested in.
So as I said, just to put this down in writing, this is a way of relating the particular property's value to a location on the periodic table, and that's what we're going to use to identify patterns between the periodic table shape and the property value itself. So to wrap things up, a uh, quick list of things you should be able to do right now. Uh, you should be able to discuss the basic layout of the periodic table, the idea of groups and periods, and I do expect you to be familiar with the group names themselves. Uh, you should be able to identify what a periodic trend is, the idea of regularly recurring patterns on the periodic table. And you should be able to define and explain the basic characteristics that we're focusing on in terms of trends. What is atomic radius? What is electronegativity? And what is ionization energy? In future videos, we're going to discuss the results of the plotting that we just talked about, and we're going to talk about an explanation chemically for why atomic radius, electronegativity, and ionization energy have the particular patterns that they have. And those explanations are going to be based on the electron configurations of the elements involved, which again is how all of this ties into this particular chapter.